be very, um, very useful, actually. So um, A x equals B is a model for, uh, you can think of it, uh, if you're in signal processing, as an example of, um, of uh, it's, it's, it's a linear measurement problem. So in the real world, you have many types of analog signals, maybe sound, images, video. Um, and you can think of a, lo a, lot of a lot of data as just a string of, of n numbers, n real numbers, sometimes n complex numbers. Um, in other words, a big vector. So for example, a megapixel image, you can think of it as a, m a million pixels or a million numbers, one for each, measuring the intensity of each pixel. So, um, and, and the same for sound and video. So lots and lots of data that we care about in the world, uh, you can think of mathematically as, as huge vectors, say million dimensional vectors. And um, in many cases, we, uh, we can't measure these, these uh, vectors directly. We can't measure the components of these vectors directly. Um, instead, um, what we do is that we measure some other numbers that are related to the signal we're trying to measure. Um, and they could either be linear measurements or nonlinear measurements. Um, if they're linear measurements, then what you do is that mathematically is that you take your, um, your unknown signal x and you multiply it by a big matrix A. This is your measurement matrix. And it'll be some m by n ma um, measurement matrix. And it's the output B that you measure. So B will be some m-dimensional vector. So each element of B will be some linear combination of, um, of the coefficients of, of x. So you might measure, for example, the sum of all the, um, of all the coefficients or some other combination of these coefficients. Um, and so you want x, but what you have instead is b. Um, so this happens all the time. For example, um, if, you're, if, you're, if you have some um, time series, like a sound wave, and you want to analyze it maybe spectrally, you will take the Fourier transform, and you can see Fourier coefficients rather than the time series itself. And in that case, A is some sort of Fourier matrix. And so um, often, so you see some transform of the signal rather than the signal itself. So uh, the first basic problem in linear algebra is if you know A and if you know B, can you recover X? OK, the, that's a classical problem. Um, and um, OK, and so you don't want to take, you, you know, in, in many cases, you don't want to take too many measurements. So, um, one basic question is, what's the few, if you have an n-dimensional signal, let's say a signal of a million degrees of freedom, a million degrees of freedom, how many measurements, m, do you need before you can actually recover the signal? Okay, in other words, when can you solve ax equals b? For which values of m and n can you solve ax equals b? So this is a classical question, and it has a classical answer. So as we learn as an, an, as an undergraduate, the, uh, uh, the classical answer is as follows. Um, so if you take at least as many measurements as unknowns, if m is at least as big as n, and if a is full rank, uh, which is usually the case, then uh, we call the problem a equals b a determined problem if m is equal to n. Can we assume we know nothing about a, a priori? Oh, we're given a. We're so, given so, 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 yeah, OK. Now, th th that would be a much harder problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, OK. No, you're, you're, um, a is like a Fourier matrix or something. A, a, a is. Um, is, 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 a, is a function of your measurement apparatus. Uh, and you know that. Um, yeah, so A is given, B is what you measure, X is what you want. OK. So, um, yeah, so if, um, if M is equal to N, or then it's, we call it a determined problem. And if M is bigger than N, we call it an overdetermined problem. So, uh, and then there's, no, then there's no problem solving A equals B. You can use Gaussian elimination or whatever. OK, your favorite uh, MATLAB tool, you can solve A equals B. Uh, of course, there's issues with noise and so forth, but let, let's, let's ignore that for now. Okay, so yeah, so if you have you know, three, three unknowns, but you have five equations, you have no, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, if you have fewer measurements than unknowns, so if you have five, five unknowns but only three equations, um, then we call the problem underdetermined. And so even when A is full rank, the problem is still underdetermined. And then um, knowing B does not tell you all, uh, everything about X. Um, but what it does is that it does restrict x to a subspace out of all the possible values that x could have been. Uh, these, um, so this is n-dimensional space where x lives in. Um, if you take m measurements, that cuts down the dimension where x can vary by m, and you now, x is now uh, restricted to some um, affine subspace of co-dimension m. OK, so it lives in some subspace. So um, you know something about x, but you don't know everything about x. But uh, OK, but in many applications, you still want to produce an answer. Uh, even though you don't know x exactly, you know x is somewhere in this space, you might want to pick um, 
uh, so out, of, out of all the possible x's, what is the best guess, your, your best prediction for what x is, is going to be? And the standard thing you do in the subject is that if you have some reason to believe that x is more likely to be small than big, um, like if x is some sort of noise term or something, then uh, the typical thing you do is that out of all the solutions x to x equals b, you pick the least square solution. You, 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 you pick the, uh, the x which minimizes the L2 norm, sum of squares of the coefficients, the square root. Okay, so that's this formula here. The, um, the least square solution out of what you do is that you take um, all the solutions to x equals b, and then you pick the x that minimizes, that's what argument means, you pick the x that minimizes the L2 norm of x. That's the least square solution, and this can be your best guess for, for x. Uh, and there are many reasons why we choose least squares instead of least cubes or something, um, because uh, it's, it's a very nice, uh, algebraically is very nice, you can actually compute this very explicitly. The least square solution can be computed, and this is again a standard linear algebra thing. It's, um, uh, you have to apply a certain matrix called the pseudo inverse of A uh, to B and you get back your, uh, your least square solution. But that doesn't tell you that's what it actually should be. No, uh, and it is, I'll, I'll get to that, yeah. So this is, I, I, I call it best guess in quotes. Okay, it is, it is a guess, okay. Um, guess. It's an easy guess, uh, that's, that's a good advantage. Yeah. So this is, uh, for example, a very low dimensional example. Um, so of course the interesting examples are the million dimensional things. I'm not gonna draw that on, on, on the screen. Here is a, a two-dimensional uh, system. So x has two, uh, there were, x has two degrees of freedom. X lives in R2. Uh, two unknown, two degrees of freedom. You make one measurement. So b is one-dimensional. And then x equals b, what it does is that it restricts x to a one-dimensional subspace, in other words, a line. So x is somewhere on this blue line. Um, and the least squares guess, uh, x sharp, is the point on that line which is the closest to the origin in the L2 sense. So another way of thinking about that so you take the L2 ball, which is in this case a circle, and you keep blowing it up until it touches the, uh, the feasible set, the set where of all x's that, that's, that uh, are consistent view measurements, uh, and the first point of contact, that's your least squared solution. Okay, so this, this is all classical, and this is what people have done for you know, over a century. Um, but uh, as, as Jim has already pointed out, it doesn't always work. Um, so there are many cases in which least squares, I mean, it gives you an answer, but it gives you a terrible answer. Um, so here's a model situation. Um, so suppose you have some discrete signal, um, like a time series of some sort, uh, so, well mathematically a function on n points, a function from 1 to n, and suppose that um, you're not measuring that function directly, but you're measuring some Fourier coefficients. So um, you're measuring a certain number of Fourier coefficients f hat of c1 up to f hat of cm. Uh, so f hat of c is just the d discrete Fourier transform of your function f. Okay, so um, yeah, if, 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 if you knew all the Fourier coefficients, if you knew all n Fourier coefficients of this function, then we have the Fourier inversion formula that tells you you can recover the entire function back. But suppose you're only given a fraction. Suppose n is one million, but you're only given 100,000 of these Fourier coefficients. How can you reconstruct the function? Um, this problem, I mean, it's an abstract mathematical problem, but it comes up, this is a toy model um, for, for example, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. So, in MRI, uh, you know, you have a human body and you want to see what's inside the human body, so you, you, uh, you start measuring all these magnetic moments. Um, and what you're basically doing is that you are, um, uh, if, you, if, you do the, uh, if you do the physics, um, you, you're thinking of the human as, as some sort of density function, and you're, you're computing uh, basically a, a radon transform of, of this function. Uh, which after some manipulations is essentially equivalent to a Fourier transform. And so ev every measurement that you make with your MRI device is like, like it's telling you some Fourier coefficients, but not all of, but, um, but uh, you know, in practice, there's only a finite amount of time you can stick the human in, in the MRI machine before, uh, before it's no longer practical. And, um, and so you, you, you never get to, to see every single Fourier coefficient that you want, you only get to see a fraction. And you still want to reconstruct um, as, as, as good, um, uh, an image of, of your original signal, in this case the human body, as, as you can. Okay, so we have this partial information. It's an underdetermined problem because you, you have fewer measurements than unknowns. And so you can try least squares. And it's an easy exercise using Plancharov's theorem to show that uh, the least square solution, if you're given m frequencies, m Fourier coefficients, and nothing else, the least square solution is simply to take the inverse, the, part, the, the Fourier series, which um, uh, which uh, incorporates those frequencies that you see, but, sends, but sets every other uh, Fourier coefficient to zero. 
Okay, that, that's what minimizes the, the, the L2 norm. Okay, so you, you just set every frequency, that, every focal coefficient that you don't see, you just say, I, I believe it is zero. And this gives you a reconstruction. Um, and this could be your best guess for your solution. But it is uh, often a terrible guess uh, because there's no reason why the Fourier coefficients you don't see should be zero. Uh, and in fact, often, in many cases, if f is uh, somehow spiky, so if, if f, for example, is like a delta function, f is, is, uh, is supported at a point, um, the uncertainty principle tells you then that the Fourier transform is spread out sort of evenly across <coughs> all of the Fourier domain. And so, you know, you see, so there's some points you see where you, see you have a large Fourier co co coefficient set, but the coefficients that you don't see, you shouldn't be setting to zero. You should be sort of interpolating them between, uh, between the, data, the, the data that you already have. <laughs> and so uh, you tend to get very bad results when you do this. So I'll show you an example. Now, this is a two-dimensional example rather than a 1D example. But um, so here we, we have a, a standard image in signal processing. This is called the Logan Shep Phantom. It's just a collection of, um, of, of, uh, of ellipses. Uh, it's an intensity function, okay, so the, okay, the function is zero here and maybe 255 here and so forth. Okay. So uh, this is, if you like, a very toy model of a cross-section of a human body. So this it, uh, is uh, uh, kind of like what, what, what an MRI machine would see. And then uh, your MRI detector would detect various magnetic moments, magnetic moments at different angles. <laughs> and for each angle that it makes measurements, uh, it takes a radon transform in that direction, which after uh, a, a small transformation is the same as, as, as um, computing Fourier coefficients in that direction. So the picture in the middle here, this is the Fourier domain. Um, so this is, this is a spatial image. You take the, you take the discrete Fourier transform, and uh, you, that gives you another function, which I'm not displaying here, on uh, the Fourier domain here. Um, but we don't get to measure the entire Fourier um, uh, 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 coefficients. So um, we only get to see the Fourier coefficients on these white lines. Okay, so. Um, for every direction, you, you, you make one set of measurements, and that will give you all the four coefficients on that, on that one line. And then you move your detector, and then you, you, you make another series of measurements. That gives you another set of four coefficients on another line, and so forth. And you do this 20 times, or 22 times. And, um, okay, and, and you get some partial Fourier information uh, on about 5% of phase space in, in this particular case. Um, and so this is partial Fourier information, um, and it's a, it's a model for what an MRI machine might actually do. Um, and then if you take least squares you, uh, and you reconstruct, you get this big mess here. Okay, so it's, it's, it's a very poor reconstruction. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it, you can see some features, but obviously very low resolution. Um, it's a, unfortunately, the, the focus is not good, but um, there are these, uh, I don't know if you can see them, but there, there, there are these sort of um, artifacts, these edge artifacts. The, um, the image actually has, uh, has, a lot of, has a lot of straight lines in them, and that's because you are reconstructing yeah, you're only taking Fourier series on, um, uh, uh, along these lines. I and mean, you take Fourier transforms, the uncertainty principle stretches those into, into edge artifacts in, in, the, in the normal direction. So there's lots of artificial effects which are not part of the original signal, but they're coming from the fact that you're from, from, from the distortion caused by your reconstruction method. So uh, this was actually our starting point. We wanted to find a better way to, to make measurements um, than, than just this. Okay. So, um, all right, so we want to do better in solving x equals b than, than least squares. Um, now, there are some cases where you really can't do any better. Like, if, if, if you know nothing else about x, then x really could be anywhere on this set x equals b, and least squares is as good as any other guess, really. But there are, there are lots of cases where you, uh, x is, is not just a random vector. It has a lot of structure and you want to somehow use that. Um, so I sort of said before that, that um, um, when x is very spiky somehow, it's, um, uh, you, you expect to do a lot better. Um, and what does spiky mean? Well, there's, there's various models for what spiky means. But uh, the simplest model is, is you consider vectors that are sparse. So um, instead of recovering arbitrary vectors, uh, con uh, con consider the task of recovering a signal which is n-dimensional, but for which most of the coefficients are 0 only say s of the coefficients are non-zero. So we call it an s sparse um, um, vector. So maybe there's one million numbers, but only 1,000 of them are non-zero. OK, but the key point is I don't tell you which 1,000. There are 1,000 somewhere. Um, so going back to the phantom, OK, this phantom here, um, it's not all that sparse. I mean, there, there is a big black region here, but you know, about 50% of the region of, of this set, is, is, of this set is, is, is not black. So uh, this vector is not directly sparse per se. But if you look at this gradient, 
uh, if, you take the, if you look at the, the gradient of, of this function, then this gradient is, is zero in, mo in, in most places except at the edges here. Um, and if you look at, at the gradient signal, which has almost the same Fourier transform up to a, a normalization factor then as the signal itself, then um, the gradient is actually very sparse. It's concentrated on, 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 a, on, a, small, on a small set. So even you know, if this is a, a megapixel image, you know, there's, there's a, a million data points here. But if you look at the gradient, you know, almost all the data points are zero. There's only like a small fraction of um, the points which are, which are non-zero. Um, but again, you don't know where they are. I mean, you know, these edges are really the most important information about the signal. signal. That's what you want to find. You know, do you see a tumor there or not? You know, that kind of thing. OK. So, um, okay, so, um, all right, so we can't solve A equals B for under underdetermined systems in general, but suppose you're sparse, does that help? Okay, uh, oh, yeah, so why sparsity? Um, yeah, so, um, okay, so sparsity is, is in, in, in practice, it's not entirely a realistic model. You know, not all, I mean, the, the phantom, its gradient was, was sparse, but that's a very special image. Uh, Real-world images are not completely sparse, but um, often they are approximately sparse. Like you take an image, a megapixel image, um, you know, often uh, it just, it's just a million numbers, but uh, if, you, if you view it in the right basis, in fact, if you take your image and you, you for example, represent it in, uh, say, a wavelet basis, you'll find that many, many components of your, of your image are actually, um, the coefficients are almost zero. They're not quite completely zero, but they're negligible. Because many images, you know, you have a, let's say, a big blue sky, there'd be a huge region where nothing's happening. It's just a big constant color. And you take coefficients there, you get something that's basically zero. So lots and lots of images, are, lots and lots of coefficients are essentially zero. And you could set them to zero and you wouldn't notice very much loss. Now this is, what, this is how, uh, roughly speaking, how image compression works, for example. You can compress an image by, by writing in the right basis and then you throw away all the small coefficients, <laughs> but the big ones still, still contain all the information. It, it looks pretty much uh, the same as the original image. Um, yes, but um, well, it's, it's true. But, but many many uh, many signals are sparse in a known basis. So um, images, for example, you know, you, you could have blue sky over here, over here, over you know, um, the, 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 the um, different images will be sparse in different places. But they all tend to be sparse in the same basis, the same wavelet basis. You can you can pick one basis for all of them. And then there are other signals which which, which are always you believe to be sparse in the Fourier domain. There's other signals always sparse in the time domain. Okay, so um, you have to make an a priori assumption as to what your signals look like um, for, this, for this. But in, in practice, many real-world signals do have specific structure which you believe, you know, uh, which you expect to, to be the case. Okay, so, all right. Um, okay, so sparsity should, should help, and the intuition is that if you have an n-dimensional vector, it has n degrees of freedom. But if it's only s sparse, so the only s of these degrees of freedom are active or non-zero, then really, in some sense, you only have s degrees of freedom, not really n. Now, I mean, you have, you have n sort of, um, you have n uncompressed degrees of freedom, but if you sort of compress the data and you only look at the sparse, uh, the, the, uh, the non-zero entries, you have sort of s, s degrees of compressed uh, degrees of freedom, in some sense. Um, uh, if, um, if you like, uh, being s sparse uh, means that you don't live in all of Rn. You actually live in, in a whole bunch of unions of s-dimensional coordinate planes, uh, depending on for, for which um, there are n choose s different planes, one for each choice of which s is, is uh, which s coefficients are non-zero, and then there's these, these s different planes. And so you're really sort of living in some complicated s-dimensional sub-manifold, or not it's not, not well, corners, okay, but subset of, of of your of your big set. Okay. Um, and so because you really only have s degrees of freedom, you really shouldn't need all n measurements. Uh, you shouldn't need n measurements to recover the whole signal. You should really only need about s, OK? Because your signal only has really s unknown somehow secretly in it. You should, only be, you should be able to measure with about s measurements. Um, an analogy I like to, to, to use, it's not quite uh, what we do, but it, it actually has some, some features in common. It's this classical 12 coins puzzle uh, that we sometimes give our undergraduates. Okay, if, you have a, uh, if you have 12 coins, and they're all the same weight, except for one, which is either heavy or light, you don't know which, it's one counterfeit coin, and you want to find it, uh, and you have a scale, and you have a scale and you can measure, you can put, three, you can put some coins on one and so let's see which one's heavier, um, but you're only allowed to use the, 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 the scale three times. Okay. Um, see, three is a lot less than 12. Okay, there's 12 possibilities for, for actually, there's, there's actually 24 possibilities, because there's, there's, um, the coin can be in any one of 12 positions, and it could be heavy or light. <coughs> 
But uh, even though there are so many possibilities, it's possible with just three weighings to, um, uh, to figure out which coin is, is the bad one, and even to tell whether it's heavy or light. Um, and the secret of this is basically to weigh several coins at once. So that you know, if, if you weigh them one at a time, then you're going to need something like 12 weights. Okay? But if you weigh them in batches, you, you can do a lot, a lot, a lot faster. OK, so, and somehow what's going on here is that your, you know, I mean, your, your signal, which is the kind of your coin, in an uncompressed sense has 12 degrees of freedom. But in, so in a compressed sense, it only has one degree of freedom. So you, 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 sh uh, you can do a lot better than 12. You can't quite do one, but you can do closer to one than you can to 12. Um, yes. Okay. Well, let me let me let me get. I'll, I'll, um, yeah. It's. Uh, yeah. People. Yeah. I mean. Um, okay. The the next thing I'm going to say was sort of well known, although maybe not at the top of uh, uh, at the top of people's uh, thoughts. But uh, uh, yeah, the main task is, as you say, is a competition problem. As you say. Um, uh, okay. Uh, that's not quite yet. But uh, okay. Okay, but the, the punchline which I'm going to say is that, is that uh, this can be done. Okay, that, that if your signal is sparse, um, then you can, in many cases, uh, recover the signal using measurements that are proportional to the compressed size rather than the uncompressed size. And this is uh, useful in a number of applications. It's, it's, it's not useful in every single situation. Um, I mean, people, there are lots of places where A equals B can be solved without any trouble already. But there, was, there were several situations where the classical methods were not, were not working well, and now, now we have better methods. Uh, basically, every time you know that the signals are sparse in a known basis, as you said, it, 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 uh, you have to know what basis you're, you're sparse in. Um, and any time measurements are expensive, that you know that um, you don't you don't want to you, you really want to minimize the number of measurements to, uh, needed to recover your signal. Uh, expensive either uh, in, in money terms or in time terms. For example, MRI is expensive in time. As I said, you don't want to have the patient sit there for hours uh, while you're collecting every last period coefficient. Um, and um, okay, uh, in, in some cases, a power is actually uh, energy consumption is, is actually a cost. Um, there are these things called sensor networks where you want to you want to monitor an environment for a long period of time using these very cheap sensors, these ten cent sensors, which you know um, take one measurement and then and then emit it by radio frequency or something. And you know that costs that costs power, and you don't want to keep going back in, into your environment and changing one million, one million batteries every every few months. Okay, you want um, uh, so um, there are, okay. So there there are many cases in which uh, measurement is expensive. Um, astronomy is an, as another classic case. Telescope time is an extremely uh, ex uh, scarce resource. Um, um, so measurements are expensive, um, or rela related to this, your sensors. Um, um, are, are very, very dumb. So, um, so I mentioned image compression. So, you know, um, c like digital cameras nowadays, you know, they, um, they have lots and lots of CPU in, uh, in, in that they have, they have advanced computer chips. They can uh, do compression by themselves. So what they can do is that they can take a really big image, you know, take a megapixel image, 10, 10 megapixels nowadays, and then, you know, compress it down to a tenth of the size uh, to store it and do all that within the computer, uh, within the camera. And so then they can take many, many pictures. And that's not a problem. Um, and so we don't, we don't anticipate compressed sensing being taking over uh, consumer cameras because they can already do image processing fine by themselves. But there are many applications, such as sensor networks, where your, your sensors are, are very, very dumb. And they don't have the, 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 the power to, to do any fancy processing other than do something like take one simple linear measurement and then send it, transmit it. Now, if your sensors are very dumb, but uh, this, is the, but, uh, this is a key point, though. Uh, once you collect all the data, then you have a computer. Okay. Th then you're allowed to do whatever algorithm you want once you collect all the data to, to reconstruct the signal. So um, data acquisition is expensive, and you're not allowed to use fancy computational tools to get the data. But once you have the data, uh, once you have the measurements, you can reconstruct the signal. You can use whatever, you can use whatever computer power you want. Um, are there important cases where the signals are not sparse in any sense? Um, or is it just some assumption you can always make it? Uh, well, I mean, I, it, at some point, it was garbage in, garbage out, right? I mean, if, um, okay, I mean, so often they're not completely sparse, but they, for example, typically they obey a power law. Um, so a, a large fraction of them will, of coefficients will, will dominate, and then there'll be a smaller fraction that are small, have a smaller size and a, a, a tail. Um, and these type of methods work when uh, they're robust in, in that sense. If they're just completely random, 
then you can't really do anything. You have to use all, all you have to, there's no compression, so. Um, but then you just use traditional sensing, I mean, okay. Okay, so uh, just to answer the question, okay, so um, the first question is theoretically, you know, can this work? You know, uh, uh, if, uh, suppose you're given um, an infinite amount of processing power, right? If, if you had a, if you had infinite computing capacity, can you reconstruct an S bar signal using only S measurements? Uh, the answer is not quite, but if you use two S measurements, if you take twice as many measurements as, um, as um, the sparsity, th then you can uniquely reconstruct. So th this, this, was, this is quite classical, and it, in fact it has a, has, has a four-line proof, as you'll see. So the, um, okay, what's the statement? Um, yeah, suppose you have an S bar signal, and you take at least two S measurements, um, Actually, the, the, the more precise uh, statement you need is that uh, your matrix A has to have a special property. It has to have the property that any two S columns of your matrix should be line linearly independent. Now, uh, your columns are M dimensional. So as soon as M is bigger than two S, it's quite likely if you pick it, just almost any, any matrix that you have this property. So this is basically saying, the, the thing to think of this is like a, like a full rank assumption. Okay, that you get at least, okay, basically it's saying that if your matrix is full rank in this funny sense, and uh, you have at least two S measurements, then, any S bar signal can be reconstructed uniquely. And this is a very simple, uh, very simple statement, and, and I'll even give you the proof. So, um, yeah, so uh, the statement is that, is that once you know AX, you can re uniquely recover X. So suppose you can't. Uh, if you can't, that means that there are two different X, uh, S bar signals, X and X prime, which are both sparse, but when you measure them, they give exactly the same measurements. Okay, that, then you can't, so th that's, that's what it means to not be able to uniquely reconstruct the problem. So then, AX equals AX prime. But this is a linear problem, so you can move the X prime to the other side. That's the same as saying A times X minus X prime is zero. But X is sparse, and X prime is sparse, so X minus X prime is 2S sparse. And so, and if you think about what it means for A times this 2S sparse actually to be zero, that's saying that there's a linear dependence between 2S of the columns of A. And we assume that that doesn't happen, so this can't happen unless, of course, this was zero, and then it was X is X prime, okay? So if you have a uh, unique, um, yeah, so w w uh, once you take two S measurements, this proposition tells you you can reconstruct. Okay, so we have this theorem, um, but it is a useless theorem. Uh, it's useless because while it tells you that X can be reconstructed, it doesn't tell you how. Uh, well, that's actually a slight lie. I mean, if you, you, can, you can, what this proof tells you is that if you find one S sparse solution to X equals B, there's no other S sparse solution. Hence, the solution that, that is the truth, the S bar solution, is the sparsest solution among all the feasible, among all the feasible sets. So in, this does give you a formula, if you wish, for exact reconstruction. So if you, if you have an S bar solution to A x equals B, and you, you obey this condition in the, in the previous proposition, then your X can be reconstructed. It is the, um, among all the solutions to A x equals B, you pick the X which is sparsest. So you don't minimize the L2 norm, you minimize what we call the L0 norm. What's the naught norm? We don't teach that in analysis classes. The naught norm is the sum of the zeroth powers of your, of your coefficients, where the zeroth the powers are defined to be zero if your coefficient is not is zero, and one if your coefficient is non-zero. So that, that's actually, uh, all right, this is a, it's a, normally zero to zero is supposed to be one, but for this, for this, predic, uh, for this particular uh, uh, talk, it's, it's zero. Uh, if the, uh, more precisely, the L naught norm is the limit of the LP norm for P, as P equals to zero. That's actually maybe a better, a better definition. Okay, but uh, that's just a fancy name for the, the number of, of non-zero elements of, of your, of your, um, your sparsity, okay? So, um, okay, so if you want to find the sparse solution, if you want to find the S sparse solution, just minimize the sparsity among all feasible sets, okay? So we, now we have a formula, we have an answer uh, to how to recover. But unfortunately, this is, answer is also useless. Uh, the reason is because minimizing sparsity turns out to be an incredibly computationally hard problem. Basically. There are, uh, you, have, you have to search over all n choose s different combinations of what sparse things are, and n choose s can get really, really big. Um, in fact, this problem turns out to be what's called NP hard, which means that if you can solve this, you can solve any other NP, NP complete problem and collect a million dollars. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, if, if, uh, in fact, if you, if you know what the subset sum problem is, you can encode the subset sum problem as a special case of, of, this, of this problem here. Uh, or the net knapsack problem is also called, uh, it's very similar. Um, Okay, um, one reason for this is that minimizing L2 is very easy because L2 is always one for properties, it's a Hilbert space, but actually more importantly, it's just convex, and we have all these convex minimization tools. The L0 norm, well, not, not even a norm, it's not convex at all, 
and we don't have minimization tools for from north. Okay, so um, to summarize, okay, so this um, here's sort of where people were at about 1970 or so. Okay, so um, all right, if you want to solve an underdetermined problem, you can try least squares L2 minimization, and it's very quick. It gives you an answer, but it's often the wrong answer. And then, but if you're sparse, you can try instead L0 minimization. That gives you the right answer, but it is impossible to compute. Okay, so neither of these two things uh, work, but is there a way to split the difference? Is there a way to find an algorithm which is both easy to compute and gives you the right answer? Right. So I phrased it this way to make the answer more natural. Uh, it, was, it was only natural in retrospect. Um, so the, uh, the way that actually works pretty well, rather than minimize L0 or L2, or, or L2 it's actually minimize L1. Um, so among all solutions to x equals b, um, you minimize not least squares, not L2, which is least squares, and not L0, which is sparsity, but you minimize L1, the sum of the absolute values not squared of the coefficients. Um, so you see, L1, unlike L0, the L1 ball is convex, and so you can use convex op uh, optimization to solve this problem. In fact, it's even a linear programming problem. You can use, say, the simplex method or any other off-the-shelf method to solve this even when you have a million dimensional. It's not really a problem. You can do that in a few seconds. Um, and in fact, because of compressed sensing nowadays, people have designed specialized uh, software packages just to solve this one problem because it's so useful. Um, so it's very quick. And unlike these squares, it actually works. It gives you the right answer. Um, so I'll explain why. Well, you can, I'll prove it by a picture. And this picture really explains everything. Um, so we saw before that uh, least squares, um, and maybe go back to least squares first. Okay, so here is, here is, uh, here's a, so here is, we have x, we're solving x equals b, um, and we have this least square solution. But this least square solution is not very sparse. Both of the, co both of the coefficients are non-zero, okay? The, the two sparse solutions are the ones where you hit the x and y axis, okay? So it, it's missing the sparse solution here, okay? Um, On the other hand, when you minimize using the L1 norm, so you take the L1 ball and you enlarge it until you hit the feasible set, the L1 norm is much pointier than the L2 ball. And in fact, it's the pointiest you can be while still being convex. And that's sort of why it works. Um, and what, what's more, the corners of, of, the, uh, of the L1 ball happen to sit at very sparse vectors. Um, and so when you, when you enlarge this ball, you are really likely, the point of first contact is extremely likely to lie at a, to, 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 to lie at a sparse point. In fact, usually at the sparse point. Um, in this particular case, there's a tie. I mean, here there are two points which are sparse. Uh, that's actually just because it's low dimensional. If I gave you a much higher dimensional picture, gave you a million dimensional, I'm not going to tell you what you can't, but okay, if I give you a, a million dimensional picture, say co dimension 10,000 subspace, uh, which is pretty generic, then generically, actually, the L1 ball hits the, uh, the subspace at the sparsest point, usually. So that's now a theorem. Um, but okay, but this picture is sort of a very low dimensional shadow of, of, of that fact. Okay, <clears throat> and um, in fact, one of the first things we did was that we, uh, we took our Logan Shep Phantom and we took these partial, these 5% of the Fourier measurements and we did L1 minimization. So we, we took, um, so we took all the, um, among all signals which match our measurements on, um, on the white lines which are where we see, we picked the, the signal which minimizes the L1 norm. Actually. As I said before, um, it's not the signal which is sparse, it's the gradient which is sparse. So actually, you want to, you want to minimize the L1 norm of the gradient. This is called the total variation. Okay, so you actually do total variation minimization. Um, but, um, but if you do that, uh, what we found is that uh, we actually did recover the signal exactly, pixel for pixel. Uh, the, 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 exact reconstru the reconstruction is exactly the same as what we started with, even though you only have 5% of, um, of, of, of the data. Um, it's because you know the signal is really, really quite sparse if you look at it in the right way, and you you, you can do you can get by with just five percent of the data. Okay. Um, all right. So um, this is called basis pursuit. Uh, it's uh, because of the algorithm that's used to to solve it. Um, yeah. So we didn't come up with this. Um, people discovered it empirically in the sciences. So in fact, the first people to uh, to actually use basis pursuit were actually seismologists. Uh, because they had a they had, would have been dealing with compressed sensing issues for for decades, you know what they want to do is that they want to figure out where the fault lines are in the Earth, okay, uh, and that's a sparse signal, okay, um, and the way they do it is that they 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 bounce waves or they wait for waves to, to bounce off um, of um, um, 
off of the Earth, and they find, they, they find the echoes. And they, what they're basically doing is, is that they're, they're measuring various Fourier coefficients of a very sparse signal. Uh, and then they want to reconstruct the signal. It's, it's, it's L1 minimization, yeah. Same yeah. Um, yeah, so they, they tried least squares because that's what the textbook said, and they gave horrible, horrible answers. Um, and then they, they wanted uh, L0 minimization, they couldn't do it. And so at, at some point, I don't know exactly how they came up, you know, because they, they needed an answer, right? Okay, and I mean, the scientists, right? Um, they, uh, someone tried L1 minimization, and it worked very well. But they had no proofs. There's just an empirical fact that it worked. Um, I should also say that I, I didn't put this on the slide, but the stat statisticians have also uh, come up with a very similar thing. It's called the lasso, uh, lasso selector. Uh, they have a very similar problem where they have a, um, um, a sparse number of factors in influencing a whole bunch of measurements, and they want to find which, which measurements are, are causing um, the, the data. Um, you can do the same thing. OK, um, so um, people only start, really started studying it theoretically in the 90s. Um, and uh, so, what started ha so people started creating these these results saying that uh, if you're s sparse, then a typical result is if you're s sparse, then if you take say s squared measurements, then that's enough to reconstruct. Then basis pursuit works. So there were some results which were non-trivial, but they were not cl close to optimal. Um, so what happened in um, in the last few years, by uh, partly by myself, Emmanuel Kendes, Justin Romberg, and also Donna Ho and several other people now. Is, uh, is that we found that actually um, you can theoretically show that this method works um, almost um, to opt optimal, uh, optimal performance levels. So I said the theoretical limit is 2s. If, um, ideally, um, you should be able to reconstruct an s bar signal of 2s measurements. We can't quite do that, but we can do about 4s. So it's, it's, really, it's really pretty good. OK, I should say that L1 is not the only method out there. It's just one of the first ones. There's now a whole bunch of other methods uh, there's something called matching pursuit, which is uh, um, uh, sort of a greedy algorithm method. And then there's hybrid methods, and, and there's, uh, well, okay, it, 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 it's, it's, there's a huge industry in improving these methods. But um, so basically. What's characterizing these other methods? There's two main, there's two main families. There's, there's, there's basis pursuit L1 and, and sort of things derived from L1. Um, and then there's matching pursuit, which is a bit different. It's a. Uh, um, um, among, um, so you can rephrase the, the compressed sensing problem as, as one that you, you have some dictionary of, of basis vectors and you have your, your signal, your measurement vector, and you, wanna, and you know your measurement vector is a, is a linear combination of a sparse number of your basis vectors. And you want to figure out which, which, of, uh, which sparse vectors actually do make up your, your, your big vector. And one way is, is basically a greedy algorithm. You, you, you find the vector which has the biggest inner product with your measurement vector, and that's a, that's a likely candidate to. To, uh, to, to, to be in your, in your sets. Then you project out that vector, and then you, you find the biggest residual vector, and you, you keep doing that. Uh, that by itself doesn't quite work all that well, but there are ways to, to tweak it to actually make it reasonably effective. Um, but I, I won't talk about uh, those methods here. OK. So uh, we have some theoretical results. Um, so I mean, it, it doesn't work for all matrices. OK, I mean, yeah, yeah, you have to make assumptions. For every one of these results, you have to make some assumption on your matrix A. Okay. For example, if metric A is zero, you can't do anything. Okay. So if it, you always need something like full rank, or that's some columns are independent, and so on and so forth. Um, or you can work with special, specific models, such as Fourier models. Um, but what's, what we've learned in the last few years is that, um, for, that there are very, very general classes of matrices for which compressed sensing works, like this L1 thing works. Um, and the main thing your matrix has to do is that it has to be what we call incoherent. Uh, what that means is somehow that, that um, its, en its entries are sort of spread out evenly. It's, it's not a sparse matrix. Um, if you have a sparse matrix, then, then you have a real problem. Like suppose, you, suppose your measurement matrix is like an identity matrix. So every measurement only measures one coefficient. If you, if you only see one, if you, that's, like tick, that's like the 12 coins problem where you only weigh one coin at a time. Okay? If you, if you're, or you're trying to measure an image by only take, taking one image at one pixel at a time. Okay? If you have a sparse image, you might, you might completely miss, um, if you take sampling, um, one pixel at a time, you might completely miss the image, if you, unless, you start, unless you sample essentially everything. But if you take a more incoherent measurement system where every measurement sort of is a linear combination of, of lots and lots of, of entries of, of, your, of your signal, then um, that's much more efficient. Uh, then, 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 then you can sort of see all the sparse signals much more, uh, much more efficiently. And it seems that as, as, as long as your matrix is incoherent enough, um, um, compressed sensing works. Just like you can, you can solve the 12 coins problem if you weigh lots and lots of coins at once. 
Um, OK, so there are lots of results uh, now. Uh, here's a typical one. He's one of the first ones, um, Manuel Kendes, Justin Romberg, and myself. Um, so here we are. Uh, this, this is the situation I, I said at the very beginning. You have a, a signal on n, on n points, but it's s sparse. And we take m measurements, m, m Fourier measurements. We, we measure um, some fraction of the Fourier coefficients. Um, and we have to make one assumption. Um, is that so? You might think that we should you should pick a very clever set of frequencies to, to do your recovery. Maybe some you know I don't know zeros of Chebyshev polynomials or something very fancy. But actually, what works um, is uh, is that you pick your coefficients randomly. It's kind of like a Monte Carlo method. You, you, you just pick if you pick m random frequencies and just look at at m, at m random points, um, m random frequencies. It turns out that uh, as long as you pick them randomly, um, every uh, um, yeah, then, then you are guaranteed to actually recover your solution, your s bar signal, as long as you take um, enough measurements. Now, the theoretical limit is 2s, um, but in our theorem, we actually have constant times s times log n. Uh, and this constant is not too bad, actually. It's actually about 12. Um, so, okay. Uh, um, although in practice, if you do it numerically, actually about 4s suffices. Uh, this is just what we can actually rigorously prove. Um, it is important to choose things randomly. I mean, um, the problem is that if you choose, um, well, actually, it's not so much that you choose it randomly, but the one thing that's really bad is that if you choose your frequencies in an arithmetic progression, because it turns out that um, there are sparse signals whose Fourier transform could be supported on a different arithmetic progression, which is disjoint from your current arithmetic progression. Uh, there's something called the Dirac comb. Um, and so if, if, if you chose just the wrong set of frequencies, then you would just completely miss all your data. Um, but if you choose it randomly, then a random set will sort of intersect every one of these funny combs, and, and you will never miss any of your data. So it's, it's sort of important to, to sort of move randomly. Right, yeah, so, um, yeah, it's true. I, I, um, um, yeah, it's a bit hard to see in low dimensions, but uh, yeah, in, in, in high dimensions, uh, yeah, your, your, your hyperplane can, can, can it's, it's, well, first of all, it's not really a hyperplane. It's, 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 it's much lower, uh, yeah, it's much lower dimensional. But it, it, it can hit the, uh, your L1 ball in a, in, a, in a rather high dimensional facet um, rather than at a corner. Um, and so occasionally things can go bad, but, uh, it's, but all the low high dimensional facets are sort of protected by the corners. And so the corners usually get hit first. Um, yeah, I mean, th there is unfortunately a, a slight failure rate. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so one annoying thing is that even though uh, we have these results that say that if you pick things randomly, then with 99.99% probability, this thing works. But we can't actually produce a single explicit example of a matrix for which compressed sensing works. This is actually very annoying. Um, we, we can't produce a single deterministic example of a matrix for which this method is guaranteed to work. We know they pick a random matrix, then with high probability it works. But uh, we, we have no way to actually find a deterministic one. That's, a, that's, a, that's an open problem in the subject, actually. Um, but it's good enough for, for many, many applications. Uh, if you don't care about a point zero zero one failure rate. Okay. Um, yeah, so as I said, uh, okay, as long as your your um, four S sparse or so, roughly speaking, um, compressed sensing works for Fourier reconstruction. And in fact, um, just about, uh, and there's, there's uh, just about very, very um, large classes of matrices. Um, uh, this method works. So there's, there's, a, there's a general theorem, which I won't state here. Um, so I showed you before this abstract lemma that said that if you had a matrix A, such that every 2s columns were, in, were linearly independent, then you can reconstruct it from 2s measurements uh, using this, this, L, this, this impractical L0 algorithm. So there's an analogous result for, for basis pursuit that says that if you, if instead of 2s, you, assume four, you take 4s columns. And if you assume that the 4s columns are not just independent, but they're what's called almost orthogonal, uh, which means that uh, their, their singular values are close to one. Um, then, um, um, then compressed sensing will work. You just take four S measurements. You, re reconstruct, you can reconstruct the signal. Um, so um, yeah, so this is, there's a precise property, which is this almost orthogonality. It's called the restricted iso isometry property, which has the unfortunate initials RIP, but th th these initials are stuck. So we have, um, but the thing is that many, many types of matrices obey this property, like in particular random matrices. Uh, obey this property. Okay, so um, oh, I have to speed up a bit. Okay, so there's 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 lots and lots of um, of variants of this. So I talk about sparse um, uh, rec recovering sparse data. You can also recover things like uh, compressible data, data that obeys a power law, for example, a data which is almost sparse plus a tail. 
Um, we can also handle noise if you if you if you so in practice you never quite measure AX. You measure AX plus some some noise, uh, say which could be for example Gaussian white noise is a typical model, and uh, so now you have some noisy measurements. Um, but often what happens is that if you take noisy measurements, then you can't hope to reconstruct X back exactly, but you can sometimes hope to reconstruct it back uh, approximately. And in fact, you can with, with this method. Let me just uh, give you the picture that explains this. Okay. So in this picture, the, uh, the upper black dot is your original signal. That's x. Okay? So then you take a measurement, which is b. So in a noise-free world, b would be ax. But uh, in, 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 the, in the noisy world, b is only approximately ax. And so you don't know that b, ax is equal to b. You know that ax is close to b. So you don't get to pin x down to a single line, which is this blue, blue line here. Instead, you pin it down to a strip, like a cylinder in general. Okay? In this case, a strip, the strip between these two red lines. Okay, so that, uh, Okay, so your feasible set is now this strip, but what you can do is that you just do the same algorithm. For all, um, uh, uh, for all feasible points, you pick the one with the least L1 norm. So you just take the L1 norm and you, and you L1 bore and you enlarge it until it, it touches the feasible set, and it will do so at this lower black dot, and that's not the same as the original black dot, okay, but it's pretty close. Okay, so you, you, you get some, um, some reasonable, so the, uh, the error is actually proportional to the, to the, the noise level. In, in, in your system, and that's the best you can do, really. Um, yeah. I'm not not quite sure I understand. The well, suppose you found, suppose it pushed you into the body of the L1 ball, and then there would be many solutions. But the ball is dilated, right? You're looking for the smallest. Oh, so yeah, so yeah, then there'll be a smaller, then the point of first contact with people say. Okay. Could you also have the noise in the A itself? Yes. Um, yeah, there are some results which can handle that. Uh, yeah, there the results are actually a little bit uh, less satisfactory so far. Um, that that is a problem. I'll, I'll show you a real world example where this thing actually works. Um, in, in, in a minute. Um, it's true, yeah. Uh, we don't have all the theoretical results that we would like to have in order to be completely convinced that, that this works, but we have a representative sample of theoretical results, and we have a lot of numerical experiments now which are very convincing, and we have actually even some real-world real -world demonstrations. So it's, it's good enough for government work, all right, uh, so far. Um, okay, um, maybe I'll skip for lack of time. Uh, Dual compressed sensing, which is kind of fun, but uh, skip that. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll mention this one though. Um, one recent thing we've been doing is uh, matrix versions of compressed sensing. So um, I talked about um, minimizing uh, you have a, your, if your signal is a sparse vector. But there are um, many applications where your signal is, is not naturally a vector, but more naturally a matrix. And you want to recover a matrix, and, but you only get to see like, individual pieces of a matri matrix. Um, and the most famous example of this is the Netflix prize, which actually just won a, a few months ago. Um, so Netflix is, uh, you should know what Netflix is, okay? You, 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 uh, you, know, you, you, can, you can get movies by mail from, from, from this, this company, and, then, and you can rate the movies that, that you get, and then they try to suggest to you what other movies you might like to watch based on, on your preferences. Um, and the, you know, in order to have a good customer experience, they want to, to make predictions that are as accurate as possible. You know, they don't want to recommend a really uh, inappropriate movie, right? Um, so what they're doing is, is that they are trying to solve a matrix completion problem. So there's this big matrix where all the rows are customers and all the columns are movies. And then the entry of a matrix is, is the rating that hypothetically the customer would give the movie if he or she watched that movie. So there's this huge matrix. Okay, but of course, you can't force every customer to watch every movie. Uh, so you don't actually get to see the entire matrix. But so what Netflix sees is it sees some reasonably random sub um, um, subset of entries of the other matrix. That's what it sees. The, the, the movies that actually the customers do watch. And from that partial information, it wants to uh, uh, complete to the best of its capability the matrix so that it can, it can predict what other movies might be, seen, be preferable to what other customers. Now, if the matrix was completely arbitrary, like if all the entries are independent, there's no way you can do this, okay? Because there's no, there's no relation between the entries you see and the entries you don't see. There's, there's nothing you can do. But um, uh, but what happens in practice uh, with these type of matrices is that they have a special structure. Um, they're low rank, usually. So you know, there may be a million customers and a million movies, but 
customers, you know, no, out of these million customers, you know, you can, you can describe the customer's preferences often by just basically, say, a 10-dimensional model. There may be only sort of 10 traits in a customer that really dominate people's uh, tastes. And if you've noticed, uh, movies are also pretty low-dimensional in, uh, in, in their features, too. You, you, can, you, can model, you can model a large number of features of, of movies by, say, a 10-dimensional space of traits. Um, the things in advance, you don't quite know what those traits are. Okay, but you can sort of believe that, 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 um, that there are these low-dimensional traits out there which, which more or less completely determine people's preferences. And mathematically, what they're saying is that your million-by-million million matrix really has rank 10. Um, so the question is, can you reconstruct um, a low-rank matrix? That's the equivalent of a sparse vector. That's the analog of a sparse vector by, uh, because, it, because the singular values are sparse, actually. Okay? By um, partial measurements. And it turns out that you can uh, you don't use the L1 norm, you use the uh, matrix version, which is called the nuclear norm, or the Shatten 1 norm, or the sum of the singular values, uh, absolute value of the singular values. So, do they the um, so the Netflix prize, okay, so what happened is so there was this prize of $100,000 for the first person who could improve, uh, first team, which could improve Netflix's original algorithm by 10%. Uh, that, and there was always rules and regulations. And so there were these teams which involved all kinds of people. So there was a team from IBM, for example, and uh, there were teams involving mathematicians, statisticians. Um, the winning team actually used um, something that we did, this, this nuclear norm minimization, as one of about 10 different things that they, they threw at the problem. And then they, they, they did a super optimization out of, on top of all the things that they tried. Uh, it, was a, it was a real sort of you know, jerry-rigged uh, thing at the end. I mean, it, was, it wasn't an elegant solution, but you know, it, it, it's, it shaved the last 0.1%, whatever, off of the previous uh, competition enough to, to win. So it was nice to see that this uh, stuff that we did on, on this was actually uh, used in some, although we never saw any of the money. But um, <laughs> yeah, anyway, no, okay. My wife watched actually surprised Netflix, but uh, anyway. Um, okay, so maybe the last thing I'll do um, is I'll, so compressed sensing is now actually used in, in many practical settings. So um, perhaps the most, um, t today, the most common use, the most common practical use of, of compressed sensing is to speed up MRI that, uh, that uh, you can take um, an MRI scan that used to take an hour, can now, now take 10 minutes, or you can keep it at, at an hour, but you now get a much higher resolution image than you did before. Um, and very, very recently, uh, people have, to have uh, it's become fast enough uh, that you, people have just begun to start making MRI movies. So rather than still photographs, they can actually take about, you know, say four or five images a second um, really low resolution images. I mean, so currently it's, it's only proof, proof of concept, so not good enough to actually do any medical diagnosis. But in the future, hopefully, the, 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 you can do, you can do uh, video MRI, which would be great for, for diagnosis and medical research. Uh, there's all kinds of things that you can't see or static images. You, you want to see things breathe. You know? um, but, um, okay, but the, 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 the very first practical application, or not a uh, physical application, of um, compressed sensing was what's called the single pixel camera, which was developed by some engineers at RISE a few years back. So um, what this does, okay, so most cameras, digital cameras have, you know, one million pixels, They're one million photo sensors which take, which each measure one in uh, intensity um, at a different location and that, that you collect that and you create an image. Uh, so the single pixel camera takes pictures using only one pixel. And the way it works is like this. So you have an image, um, you pass it through a lens, and then you bounce it off um, a mask, uh, and what the mask is, is it's an LCD, it's an LCD uh, display, uh, which some squares are white and some squares are black. Um, and which ones are white, which ones are black, are determined by some random number generator. Okay. And LCD is, is very fast, you can, flip on, you can flip from one mask to, to another very, very quickly. So you, you flip on a mask, you bounce the image off of, off of, um, off of this mask, so um, um, only, only the portion of the image that, that is on the white squares bounces up into another lens, which focuses everything onto a single photo detector. Okay, and the single pixel, um, the single photo detector measures the net intensity. Uh, what it basically does is it measures the inner product of the image intensity with this mask. So it's, it's like, it's like yeah, multiplying um, yeah, um, the image against a random vector. And then it, it transmits, uh, say by, uh, I guess in this case by, by, by radio frequencies, uh, its intensity, um, um, it, well, it digitizes it and then transmits it to a receiver, which then, process, which then stores that one number. And then you flip the um, and then you, you you flip the mask and then you do it again and you do it again you do it about a thousand times um, and this, this one this, this one photo detector takes one well, takes one thousand measurements of and and uh, and transmits this and this this gives you uh, your data and then you apply this this L1 algorithm to reconstruct this, the uh, the image. Okay, 
Um, this is actually how it looks like. Uh, this is the, so it's, uh, uh, yeah, so here's the image, the letter R. There's a light coming off, bouncing off to, to a lens, to, uh, uh, off of the, uh, off, off of the um, LCD display, and then onto your photo uh, detector, and then it gets, gets transmitted to some, to some measuring device. So not nearly as, as uh, sleek looking as your modern uh, digital camera, but uh, uh, it works. So this was the very first image that they did, for example. This is a 17K image of the letter R. And if you just take 10% of the measurements, uh, just, just to take one, one, uh, 1,600 analog measurements using, using this, this apparatus, you can reconstruct, you know, uh, not a great image, but you can at least you can recognize the image. And if you take twice as many measurements, you get a slightly better image. Um, okay. Uh, it works just as well for color uh, as for not color. I mean, color is just RGB. So it's just a vector three times the size. But uh, the same type of, of, of procedure works. Um, do I have a final slide? Yeah. Um, this slide, I think, yeah, the, the, the resolution here is not so great. Uh, this, this is, uh, this is um, a picture of a, of a mouse heart, uh, an MRI image of a, of a, of a mouse heart and, uh, and a, and a fine-scale detail. Um, yeah, unfortunately, the, the, uh, uh, the, the image quality is not so great, so you, you can't actually see this. But um, if, you, if you sample only a fraction of the measurements of, of a real-world image, uh, if you do it by, if you do it by, um, by linear reconstruction, you, you, well, you really can't tell the difference, which actually sort of defeats the point of the slide. Um, OK, the, the point was going to be that if you use compressed sensing methods, you get a, you get a, a good reconstruction. If you, use, if you use least squares, you, you get a lousy one. But unfortunately, those are both equally lousy. Uh, with this, uh, okay, but you have to trust me. The image, if you if you if you look at it, uh, I can, well, for example, you look on, on, on my laptop, it looks a lot better. But um, okay, the the the, uh, the reconstruction here is a lot better here with with MRI. Um, I think that's my final slide, so I think I'll I'll stop. apply off the shelf. Um, yeah, for, for, for digital data, uh, like 0, 1 data, um, uh, we can't use, uh, so they're naturally the, the, um, the entries take values in F2, the finite field of two elements. And all these linear programming of like L1, they don't really work. Um, there are other things that, that do work. Um, there are these, 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 these sparse codes and things, which, which sort of are like compressed sensing in, some, in many ways. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, due to the, the nature of our algorithms, uh, compressed sensing has been mostly restricted to analog signals. Um, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're digital, then, well, if you're already digital, then presumably you, you had access to a computer, okay? And then you can, you, can, you can do whatever you want with your data with that computer. Um, I mean, so it's, it's compressed sensing really, I mean, it's, it's really, really only useful when, when you're in an analog world where you, you can't take all the measurements you want and you can't massage the data already to be in a good form already. Um, Oh, okay. Well, that, that, that's a known to be a hard problem. I mean, sure. Yeah. I mean, even when you're even when you're actually when you're fully determined. I mean, or overdetermined. I mean, that, that's already hard. Never mind when you're underdetermined. Yeah. Well, suppose you're working over finite fields. Mm -hmm. you say theorem enough that you can get each solution would still be there. Yes. But you don't have those norms. Right. Right. Yes. So we don't yet have fast uh, um, reconstruction in, in that case. Um, that may well be really difficult, uh, actually. I mean, those problems are closer to sort of MP hard problems, I think, than, than the, the analog world. I mean, con convexity is all the one thing that we have that sort of beats all this, this NP barrier, the most things that are impossible, unless they're either linear or convex, basically. Right? Then we can do something. And, uh, yeah. Can you use uh, a limitization to solve other NP hard problems, like, uh, say, like travel and sales problem, where a lot of pathways are the same? Yeah. Okay. So, of course, um, yeah. This I, I, is not quite my area. Um, there are. Okay. I mean, um, the the idea of using convex relaxation relaxation to find, say, approximate solutions to non-convex problems, or in some in some special cases, exact solutions, uh, is um, people do do that. Um, yeah. So actually, I should say. Yeah. So um, when you're solving problems over finite fields, one thing you can do is that you can embed the finite field rather crudely into Rn. You know, it's zero and one, just make it zero and one. And you, have a, a, you map your, your Hamming cube into a Euclidean cube. And then you take convex hulls and you, you, you apply a convex method 
which may, may not give you zeros and ones, may give you fractions in between zero and one. Um, you, get, you, you get these pseudo solutions. Um, but sometimes, in some cases, uh, the method actually still gives you something, uh, either the, the right solution or something close to the right solution. Um, I mean, um, yeah, so uh, there are solutions, like there's this thing called the max cut problem, I think you can also do uh, in, in some ways by, by, um, by these sort of methods. Um, this, I, I'm not, uh, it's not really my field, but, but the, the, um, yeah, people do have tried using the power of convex programming, also something called semi-definite programming, which is a relative convex programming, also very good for um, approximating discrete problems, like combinatorial problems. Um, well, you can measure it, try to reconstruct it, and if it looks like garbage, then it probably wasn't compressible. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you can do slightly smarter things than that. I mean, the, the, you can you can do what's it called um, cross validation and so forth. Uh, I mean, there the, are the ways to test whether. The, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you can also detect whether something's compressible, but, but basically, I mean, this, well, you may, you may as well just, just try to reconstruct it and see what you get. Uh, um, you can reconstruct sort of based on half the measurements and see if, if, if the signal you reconstructed is compatible with the other half of the measurements. That's what, that's, that kind of technique is called cross-validation. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's also, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good for when you want to, when you're not completely sure about the, like the, the accuracy of your, of your measurements or your model. One of the questions. So it, it seems as if when you were saying that you were optimizing based on the on the variation, uh, that it was working particularly with with uh, images where there were distinct plots or so sort of a flat. But what if you have something that's very varying? It still would it still would work very well. Um, like a, a, a smoother a, a smoother image. Very smooth. Uh, yeah. yeah. So. Um, if you, if you view a smooth image in the wavelet base, in a wavelet basis, like hard wavelets or something, then again, you'll find because it's very smooth, all the high frequency wavelets will actually have a very low coefficient. So in the right basis, it's still very sparse. So you- Finding the right basis. Right, so you, you have to minimize the L1 norm or the wavelet coefficients rather than, than yeah. the, okay. But if you do that, it's, it still works quite well. Uh, what you recover is, is, is like a compressed image. Like if, you, if you've ever seen a JPEG image, which is very low resolution, you, you get these blocks and so forth. And that's the type of thing that you get when you reconstruct a smooth image by, by these methods. But I mean, that's the best you can do. If you, if you only measure 1,000 measurements, you can really only get an image of quality about 1,000 bytes. I mean, you can't hope to, to, to get much better than that.